joined again today with um, a great scholar, Lee Martin McDonald, perhaps the foremost authority in the world on the process of canonicity. How did the Bible get put together? Who chose those books and letters, the literature that we find in our current Bible? This is the our, our second interview in a series of three. In the previous interview, we covered the Old Testament. Um, how did the Old Testament canon uh, how was it formed and when was it formed and all it's just some great stuff uh we heard some great stuff from lee um if you missed the first one let me just give you a brief introduction of lee he has a thm from harvard a phd in new testament studies from uh, edinburgh professor of new testament studies and pres former president of acadia divinity school he had continuing research at harvard cambridge university other places He's been a visiting scholar and professor at Princeton. He's been a member of the um, Studiorum, Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas, the most prestigious organization for New Testament scholars. He's been a member of that since 2005, and he's been a past president of the Institute for Biblical Research, has multiple books that he has written or co-edited, co-authored with um, others on the matter of canonicity, but he is the number one authority on it. Lee, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to have you. That's a very generous introduction. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Hey, let's uh, just jump right into this. So um, I'm a Protestant, and in my Bible, when I look at this, there you've got, I've got the Old Testament and I've got the New Testament, but Catholics <laughs> and Orthodox Christians their Bibles are a little bit different. They have yes. some books between the Old Testament and New Testament that um, at least some of us refer to as the Apocrypha. And some of them are have been falsely attributed to authors and might be called Pseudepigrapha. So um, tell me a little about that. The, the books did not make the cut for the Protestant Bible uh, or Deuterocanonical. What's the difference between deuterocanonical, pseudepigrapha, and apocrypha? Wow, good question. The, uh, what we in the Protestant churches call the apocrypha, uh, Old Testament apocrypha, uh, there's a New Testament apocrypha. The Old Testament apocrypha are the books that are found in the Septuagint, but are not found in the Hebrew uh, scriptures. So. Uh, those are the, uh, the Septuagint is the Greek translation to the Old Testament. The oldest examples that we have of it are the uh, uh, more complete examples are uh, codexes. Uh, Christians produced them in the 4th century and the 5th century, and that would be Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and in the early 5th century to middle 5th century, Codex Alexandrinus. The books that are in Codex Alexandrinus are the ones that are used nowadays in the Septuagint, and uh, those are the ones that are generally included in translations in English. Uh, the uh, books that were in the Septuagint, which was the uh, Christian scriptures, uh, their first scriptures, uh, uh, what we now call the Old Testament, it wasn't called that in the first century when uh, the uh, Christians, uh, when the church was formed, when Jesus was living and subsequently the church was formed. But the term uh, apocrypha uh, has had a variety of uh, meanings. The prominent two, uh, one is that it simply means that which is hidden or secret. And it's uh, writings that were esoteric and generally a person would write something maybe like an apocalyptic type uh, literature and uh, and I won't say what is going, uh, uh, what I want to say now, but I will save that for later at a more appropriate time. So it was hidden. And you find several examples of that. And there was nothing wrong with it. It was a prophet saying, I'm, I have something to say. You can't bear it now. I'll say it more clearly later. And, uh, but eventually the term apocrypha by the fourth century began to refer to books that were rejected uh, those that uh, were either heretical or they were uh, written by someone whose uh, name was on it, but they didn't really write it. And uh, uh, that kind of that kind of a thing, or they found something wrong in it. 
And so those are the terms that are there. The churches that still use what we call apocrypha uh, are the Catholic churches and the Orthodox churches. And they have a very strong tradition within their history because the early Christians did the same. And there's a lot of parallels to that language in the New Testament, the language from some of those uh, non-Old Testament books that we call Apocrypha. Uh, and uh, uh, those books uh, continued uh, in use for centuries. There were some early church fathers that didn't like them. The first one that just said none of these and got rid of them was Jerome in the early fifth century. Hmm. Uh, but uh, up until that time, you'll find them scattered uh, in various collections or citations of church fathers. And uh, now pseudepigrapha you mentioned, uh, that's a term that is very similar uh, in many regards to apocrypha because some of the writings in the Apocrypha, like uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, was not written by Solomon, but it was attributed uh, to him. Uh, the Maccabees, uh, they're not attributed to a, uh, a famous name in the past. Generally, Apocrypha is uh, l uh, like Pseudepigrapha in that some of the writings that are attributed to a famous person uh, that famous person didn't write them, uh, but uh, they're in that collection. Uh, the same thing uh, is similar with pseudepigrapha. And scholars today, they're having, they still to this day have difficulties distinguishing pseudepigrapha from apocrypha. Pseudepigrapha literally means uh, writings under a false name. And quite often somebody would write something and uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, maybe the time when they thought that the scriptures were closed and I still have something good to say, so I'm going to put it in the name of a scriptural writer or a famous person uh, such as a prophet of the Old Testament or a, uh, a person in the New Testament that was uh, an apostle or somebody connected with that. So what those about deuterocanonical? The... Okay, deuterocanonical is a term that wasn't used in the Catholic Church until about uh, uh, 10 to 15 years after the Council of Trent in 1546. And uh, actually it's about 1555, 56, when uh, Sixtus of uh, Siena, uh, a place in Italy, uh, wrote about the proto-canonical and the deuterocanonical. The proto-canonical books were the ones that were found in the Hebrew Bible and the deuterocanonical books are those that were found uh, in the Septuagint. And the Catholic Church uh, has accepted the deuterocanonical books as sacred scripture equal to all of the others. Hmm. The Orthodox Church has, uh, they don't use the term deuterocanonical, but they call them non-canonical Old Testament scriptures, which is an interesting uh, discussion. The Russians, I got that when I was in Moscow uh, a couple of years ago, and I said, Wow, that almost sounds like a contradiction in terms. They call them non-canonical Old Testament scriptures. Uh, and, uh, but others simply call them uh, ecclesiastical writings, and Rufinus in the early uh, 5th century uh, identified them as ecclesiastical. That meant that they were good for reading. And uh, Athanasius in 367 spoke about, uh, he identified all of the books of the Hebrew Bible except Esther, and then he said, here's a group of books that are not canonical, but they are useful for reading in private, and he called them uh, uh, anagnos kamena, uh, which means readable books. Uh, it's a Greek term, and it's uh, quite popular among those in the East, the Orthodox uh, to the East. Hmm. So those books were viewed as valuable, Okay. Interestingly, the Protestants didn't stop including them in their Bibles uh, for quite some period of time. I have a facsimile of the first English uh, uh, Bible, uh, the, uh, the King James English Bible, uh, 1611, and it has the apocryphal books between the Old and New Testament. The Orthodox and the Catholics don't put them between the Old and New Testament, they put them in the same general genres, uh, types of literature, 
uh, throughout their Old Testament. They mix them uh, in between. Okay. But the Martin Luther was the first to put them. He didn't like them at all, uh, though he thought some of them were useful for reading. He hated Second Maccabees, but he put them between the Old Testament and the New, and that's been followed in uh, uh, English Bibles. The English Bibles, uh, Protestant Bibles, carried them uh, variously up until 1800, and then uh, they stopped. Uh, 1850 may have been the last date for an English Bible with the apocryphal books in it between Old and New Testament, and then it started again with the RSV in 1950. So it uh, it varied for a period of time, but they were quite popular among the uh, uh, Protestants for quite some time. The closest thing we have to the Orthodox uh, in the East, the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox, and if you want me to explain the differences, I will, The uh, uh, is the Anglican Church that uses them, reads them for value, and they're the books of the soul, uh, and that's a quote from Bovon, who was at Harvard for a number of years. Uh, they were valuable reading, but they were not canonical, and doctrine couldn't be based on them. And that's the Anglican uh, tradition. Uh, they separate the books. They're not scripture, but they're useful for reading. So it'd be uh, like if uh, it'd be like how I would view the <laughs> Apostolic Fathers. Sure. Reading First Clement and Polycarp's letter to the church at Philippi or the fragments of Papias or Ignatius's letters, right? Well, uh, that they're not considered a, a scripture or authoritative, but right. they are valuable for reading. Yeah. And some early Christians considered First and Second Clement and Ignatius and the Didache and Epistle of Barnabas as uh, sacred scripture. But eventually, uh, our 27 books of the New Testament didn't include those. But for centuries, some churches did. Okay. And in the case of uh, uh, the Pseudepigrapha, uh, Enoch is still in the Ethiopian biblical canon. Hmm. And it was in Christians, uh, uh, Irenaeus called uh, Enoch scripture, and so did Tertullian, and initially Origen in the third century, and then by the end of that period of his life, he, uh, he dropped it. And uh, then it went off the edge uh, along the way. So. Okay. The deuterocanonical books uh, now, uh, I have been called hopelessly Protestant because I always referred to them as uh, apocryphal. Uh, apocryphal books for the Catholics and the Orthodox are rejected heretical books. Okay. So. What about, uh, a lot of us are familiar with Old Testament apocrypha. What about yep. New Testament apocrypha? Oh, good. There's quite a few of those. Uh, I have a behind me a book that uh, has the listing I guess it's it's not there uh, there's several collections of them there are more books at least 80 and it seems to grow almost every year hmm. books that uh, were not included in our New Testament and they're commonly called uh, New Testament Apocrypha many of them are written in the same genres gospel letter uh, Acts and Apocalypse, or uh, like the book of Revelation. And uh, there were three prominent uh, uh, books that were uh, apocalyptic books, that only one of which was included, the uh, Revelation of John. Uh, but uh, there was the Shepherd of Hermas and the Apocalypse of Peter. Uh, but there were several books like that. And uh, more and more are coming out. Uh, a Tony Burke just came out with a new collection of them, but uh, J.K. Eliot has uh, a large collection of those those writings. And some of them are not. Uh, they don't know whether to include also all of the Gnostic writings in that. Some people separate the Gnostic writings from it because they're not all in a, a pseudonymous name, a false name. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, they vary, the scholars vary on that, and I don't know where they're going to come out. I don't focus as much of my uh, attention there, though I read them, because they tell us much about what church life was like in the second century, when uh, second to the fourth century, when most of them were written. There were some New Testament apocrypha written as late as the seventh, eighth century. Wow, I didn't know that. And, uh, hmm. Yeah, and uh, some have tried to say there was some written in the 14th century, 
uh, but very few. But most of them were written between the second century to the fourth century. And they began at the time when the apostles began. The apostles were known as the authoritative figures in the early church, but not for their writings until the second century. And then they began to be used after the apostles died and the apostolic community was there. And those writings began to move to the place of apostolic authority. If an apostle wrote it, it is sacred. It is, it's going to be read in the churches, which is the standard for what uh, canon is all about, that which can be read in the churches. Gotcha. And that's why the Gospel of Peter uh, yeah. uh, was banned from churches, because it was falsely attributed to Peter, right? I mean, the Bishop yeah, uh, Serapion around the year 200 said sure. not to... Okay, so yeah. tell me about why is it that the Protestant Bibles do not carry the Old Testament Apocrypha? Uh, some do, uh, and right. you'll find them. They're always between. You can always tell the Protestant collection because they're always between the Old and the New Testament in a block. Okay, and, some, uh, some do. And has that. All right, so why is it that some Protestant Bibles do not include them? Why was, let's say, the Wisdom of Solomon or Ecclesiasticus, First and Second Maccabees, why were they rejected? Well, uh, there came a time, and it was following the Reformation, when Protestants began to take exceptions to some of those books that were appealed to as Scripture by the, uh, the Roman Catholics. Uh, but for centuries, after the Council of Trent, in 1546, they uh, uh, they continued to include them in uh, some of their Bibles or some of them, and and I should say it's not a complete listing. Uh, the Deuterocanonicals in the uh, Orthodox they have three more books than the Catholics have, but many of them go back to the Rolfs uh, edition of the uh, uh, Septuagint. And if you take a look here, you can see a part of the size of that. But that came out that the latest edition is in 2006. Rawls has passed away quite some time ago. But uh, we don't have any evidence that those books are all the books that were in what we call the Apocrypha. Uh, there's no uh, decided list. And when you look at the various canon lists, uh, of the church fathers and council lists, they vary in terms of which books to include. Yeah, you so, told me about those, uh, and I just recently picked up this book that you recommended and that you endorsed. Uh, oh. The Biblical Canon Lists from Early Christianity, oh. Text and Analysis by yeah. Gallagher and Mead, published by Oxford oh. University oh. Press. That's that's so. correct. Yep, it's a superb book. Uh, and I got an advanced copy of it uh, from the editors. I know them both very well. I'm, the scholars that put it together, the authors, I know them both very well and, uh, and gave most of my, three-fourths of my books to them when I moved where I currently am. So we're, we're good friends. <laughs> uh, but they have done a superb job. They're both young scholars. And Oxford University Press published that, and they have a, a wonderful listing of the various uh, canon lists by church fathers and by councils, and in some of the manuscripts. And you will see uh, how the books vary that are in what we now call Apocrypha. Okay, so we've got these lists, and the lists vary. Were, was there any, what were the criteria for rejecting? in some of our Bi Protestant Bibles today, why is it that some of our Bibles do not include them? Uh, are you talking a New Testament Apocrypha Old or Testament. Old Testament? I'm sorry? Old Testament. O Old Testament. Uh, First, Second Maccabees, Ecclesiasticus, sure. things like that. Jubilees. Bottom line, let me just say up front, we don't know. Okay. But uh, uh, Eugene Ulrich from Notre Dame has put together a list of books uh, that he said, if these criteria are met, they certainly were included. Uh, if they weren't, some of them weren't included. But uh, there's no one that says, uh, here's the criteria for the Old Testament, and the rabbinic sages don't have it, with the exception of uh, they use the date when it was written. If it was written after Ezra, Nehemiah, and uh, uh, Malachi, then they, they would say it's no longer included. The other is, was it written in Hebrew? 
Now, a number of the apocryphal books weren't. The biggest question uh, for the Jews was Sirach. It was a very popular book. And uh, Sirach was uh, excluded uh, later uh, by the majority of Jews. But there's over 200 references to it in rabbinic literature. And sometimes it's as it is written in Sirach. Uh, uh, the uh, Ben Sirach uh, is their term. But those are, those are questions that varied for quite some period of time. And the early Christians simply, I think that they took the popular books that were being cited. They were Jews. And they, their collection of sacred scriptures are the same ones that you'll find parallels to at Qumran. And uh, Qumran has 12 to 20 books of Enoch. Early Christians up until Origen in the third century cited uh, Enoch as scripture. Many of them did, many of the popular uh, teachers in the church. Uh, those variations uh, are found in antiquity and uh, so we have to be careful. Now, uh, uh, Eugene Ulrich uh, speaks about if you find a text collected within a body of texts that are already recognized as scripture, yeah, that's probably in. If there were translations made of it, yes, that's in. Were there multiple copies uh, of it? Uh, yeah, that's probably in. Uh, the Temple Scroll at, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are multiple copies of that in, uh, uh, at Qumran, far more than some of the biblical books. And uh, uh, Jubilees had 14 copies. I think I said 16 previously. It's 14. And uh, then you have Enoch and Tobit. There's five copies. There's 36 copies of the Psalms. That was clearly in. Nobody ever doubted that. It's more than Isaiah. But uh, there's several uh, books that only have uh, a paragraph or a couple of copies uh, of them. So he and if a book had a commentary written on it, like in Habakkuk, clearly it was viewed as scripture. And if a translation was made of it, it likely was scripture. And that's why uh, uh, Sirach was translated by his grandson for the Jews in uh, uh, Egypt, Alexandria, and likely he thought his grandson's writing was also inspired by God and included it among the prophets. So what do you think in terms of your personal opinion? Does, does your Bible, um, you're, are, are you a Protestant? I am. Does your and, Protestant Bible include yeah. the Old Testament Apocrypha? Uh, I have a number of Bibles that have the Old Testament Apocrypha, but when I go to church, I go to a, a Protestant church and I take the Protestant Bible. Okay, but do you um, do you think do you think the apocrypha should be in there? Uh, do you think I it's have, uh, inspired and authoritative as the rest of Scripture? Interestingly, I was in a church not long ago, and folks asked me a similar question. I said, "Why didn't you go get a Catholic Bible and read some of them, or a Protestant Bible that has them in between that separates them from the Old and New Testament?" And I said, why not be informed by the same books that informed many of the early Christians? I don't see a problem with that. Yeah. When I was yeah. in Rome, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I spoke at the... Uh, but, do, but do you think that they, okay, so you, you would look at them kind of like as the Orthodox do. Well, uh, for me, I don't know of any major doctrine that hinges upon it outside of purgatory in Second uh, Maccabees, and that's what uh, uh, Luther objected to, and I would agree with Luther on praying for those that have died. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> what, let me go back. When I was in Rome, I was asked by one of the professors uh, when I was giving, I was at the Pontifical University and the Pontifical Biblical Institute, the faculty and their doctoral students. I was talking to them, and they said, do you think we got it right? And I was asked that also in Russia. And I said, yes. And when I was asked that question in a Protestant school, I said, yes, we got it right. My point is, is that the, all of the scriptures that are in those collections do not violate the basic core teachings of the Christian faith. And the earliest Christians made use of a number of them, not exactly the same. 
So I have no problems with reading them. I don't base any uh, Christian doctrine on any of those uh, texts, but I find some of them remarkably valuable, and there's much of the interpretation of the New Testament we wouldn't have a good idea of without knowing who is the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. uh, that's found, you know, in Enoch. First and then, Enoch, yep. sure, uh, that, that kind of information, uh, uh, who is the Messiah that everybody was looking for? You need that uh, material in between to help clarify a lot of issues and the social concerns. Uh, in the Old Testament, you have largely an agrarian community. In the New Testament, you have largely people living in cities. And the lifestyles and everything changes that literature helps us enormously in, in that area. So I don't disparage reading it. I encourage people to read it. And a very strong Protestant, a good friend of mine, David De Silva, mm. has written several books on the Apocrypha. And I loved his little comment on the back end of this, where uh, David talks about how uh, we are... <clears throat> we have pushed uh, the bound beyond the boundaries of our obsession with the boundaries of canon. And uh, uh, we've had so much focus on the boundaries of canon, we forget what was the core of Christianity uh, before there was a biblical canon. And I'm writing a book on that right now. Uh, and hopefully that'll come out. So I, uh, and Craig Evans, and you know Craig uh, fairly well, he's written a book on uh, introducing that literature because he, like all contemporary uh, New Testament scholars, almost all of them, say, yeah, we should be informed by it because it tells us of what happened between the end of the Old Testament and the New, and it also tells us uh, in the New Testament Apocrypha what church life was largely like and the social concerns that they were facing that that literature was addressing, hmm. even though it wasn't written by an apostle. Excellent. I don't I don't accept that as scripture, but I do accept it as helping me have a more informed understanding of the scriptures that I read. OK, so you look at it as deuterocanonical. Uh, well, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, that term meant nothing to the Catholics before uh, 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 Sixtus of uh, Siena said them. And those terms were never used before then. So. I'm talking about the church in its earliest existence, and uh, I call them religious texts uh, that were not included in the Bible, okay. and uh, my Bible at least. Now, well, let's transition to our, our final topic here, and that is uh, pseudepigraphal literature. Sure. How did the ancients? How did how did the ancients overall, or let's let's just focus on the Christians? How yeah. did they view pseudepigraphal literature? Um, more most recently you have Bart Ehrman who has made the controversial claim or yep. one that's being debated that the early Christians knowingly accepted pseudepigraphal literature and that this is evidenced by its the inclusion of some pseudepigraphal literature in our New Testaments. Um, yeah. So I, I, I know that there's a lot that is of the New Testament literature that scholars dispute. Now, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John they don't make claims to authorship in the titles or the proem or anywhere throughout. Right. So even if some or all of the traditional authors of the Gospels was mistaken, it wouldn't mean they're pseudepigraphal. But something Correct. like Second Peter, Jude, yeah. Second and Third John, um, or Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, um, these are very much disputed by... Uh, contemporary New Testament scholars. In fact, the majority of New Testament scholars, and of course, for, for, for the viewers here, we're referring, when I say the majority of New Testament scholars, I'm not just talking about conservatives, I'm talking about liberals, moderates, um, agnostic, atheist, Jewish New Testament scholars. When you take all of them into consideration who comment on this, the majority would say the second Peter, uh, second and third John, Jude, Ephesians, um, that the and probably second thessalonians yeah but i know yeah. remember ben witherington said that um he's written a commentary on that and when he looked at it um the majority he says at least in his opinion the majority do think that second thessalonians is um is is pauline 
even though it's hotly disputed. Same thing with Colossians. I remember Raymond Brown yeah. did a study and said he, yeah. he thought the majority uh, thought that Colossians was Pauline, but a slight majority. It wasn't sure. uh, anywhere near like the seven undisputed letters of Paul. Of course, first and second Timothy and Titus, most would say Paul did not write those. So if, if they're right on that, then it would seem that either the early church was fine with pseudepigraphal literature, or they did not think that these were pseudepigraphal. They thought that they were authentic. The traditional authorship was correct. You know, I, I don't I don't want to get too much off. I don't want to be talking about, I don't want this to go into a debate or not a debate, but a discussion over whether the authorship is correct, yeah. um, unless it's necessary for specific um, literature. But what do you think? Did the early, is Ehrman correct that the early church was fine with it being pseudepigraphal, or were they mistaken in thinking that about the well, traditional authorship? Generally speaking, when the church decided that a text was pseudepigraphal, written by someone uh, other than the uh, uh, actual author, uh, the actual author put it in the name of somebody else, generally a famous person from the New Testament period. Uh, when they saw that, and it could detect it, they rejected the writing. Uh, most of the time. Are there times when they didn't? I think yes. And, uh, and it raises a, a very important question. Was the issue of content or authorship the critical issue in canon formation? Who in the world wrote the book of Hebrews? And uh, everybody had an opinion on it. They were sure uh, it didn't sound like Paul, the language was different than Paul, the style of writing and even the substance uh, was other than what we know in the writings that we are sure Paul wrote. But they didn't throw it out. But notice where it's placed in the biblical canon. It's always after Philemon and uh, never <clears throat> uh, in the earliest uh, uh, catalogs, among the earliest catalogs uh, at a council, uh, at Hippo and at Carthage, uh, uh, 393, 397, they, they said Paul wrote 13 letters, and then he, it says, and the same, uh, and the same uh, Hebrews, one. And uh, uh, that uh, was changed by 419 when they said Paul wrote 14 letters, mm -hmm. and that included Hebrews. So there was some question about it, but no one wanted to get rid of it. It had a powerful message. And uh, I uh, have shared with folks the question, uh, did God only have a handful of people that were inspired to write? Maybe God had more people that had a message to say. And Hebrews has a powerful message. It was attributed to Paul and probably got in the canon because they thought Paul wrote it but they didn't want to get rid of it, even Origen, a uh, hundred plus years earlier, 150 years earlier, said God only knows who wrote it, but he wasn't willing to throw it out. Mm. So I've, I've said the issue is not uh, uh, authorship as much as content. Even the book of Revelation, Dionysus in the second century, uh, he wrote a very extensive criticism of John the Apostle writing Revelation, but he didn't want to get rid of Revelation. And Eusebius spends almost three chapters uh, telling what Dionysus said. And so I said, uh, and there's a new phrase that's coming out, or a couple of words, irresistible momentum. Hmm. There's some books that were so popular in the church that likely it would have caused an uproar if somebody tried to drop them. And some books that were dropped were still used centuries later. Uh, some of the books that were not in the fourth and fifth century canon lists and council uh, decisions are still being crit uh, held, not uh, admonished in the eighth century, ninth century, about 800 to 850, the council, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Stichometry of Nicephorus. It is a, a, a collection of writings, and it lists those apocryphal writings that you shouldn't read. And why would they say that 450 years later, if 
no one was reading them. Mm. They're still reading them. And Enoch is still read, was still read in the Ethiopian churches for quite some period of time after they, it was rejected. So uh, the content of the book was more important than the authorship of the book in most cases. So Bart Ehrman, uh, uh, he and I don't see eye to eye. Uh, he thinks only nine books of the New Testament out of the 27 were written by the authors whose names are on them. Most of those are Pauline uh, books. Uh, I, I wouldn't go that far. On the other hand, I wouldn't bet the farm on uh, whether Paul wrote the edition of uh, Ephesus, uh, Ephesians, the way that it currently is written. I mm-hmm. think it was probably rewritten, and those who made copies probably did some rewriting. And uh, I think portions of the pastoral epistles, as in Second Timothy chapter 4, I think that's legitimately Paul. And uh, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark, for he's profitable in ministry. And bring the books and parchments. I can't think of anything theological that would make somebody invent that and put it in the mouth of Paul. So I follow uh, I.H. Marshall, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Howard, Howard Marshall, uh, who says that these books probably weren't written as they are now by Paul, but somebody who wanted to have Paul's words for a subsequent generation. The key features of Pauline theology are not in the pastoral epistles. The role of the Holy Spirit, uh, reconciliation, justification by faith. You don't find those as prominent uh, in those writings and the organizational church as you, uh, in Paul's writings, as you do in the pastorals. But uh, are there some authentic Pauline uh, uh, writings in there? I've preached on the, uh, the pastoral epistles and the book of Hebrews and I, for about eight years, I went to churches and I preached on the forgotten books of the New Testament that people ignore. Hmm. Uh, we seem to have a canon within our canon, as you and I have discussed before, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, people like to read the Gospels, and uh, uh, Luke is very popular nowadays. Uh, there was a time when John was the most popular, and then when Matthew was the most popular in the early church, it cited far more times, uh, ten times more than the other Gospels. Uh, Matthew and John are cited more than Luke and Mark, but uh, that changes from generation to generation depending upon the needs of the churches and the issues that they're facing in a subsequent generation. Lee, this is um, some great stuff. I appreciate it. You know, we were originally talking about doing three videos, but uh, our next segment, next time, we're going to be talking about the New Testament canon. Ah. And I've got more questions for you, like double the questions that I've had um, <laughs> for yeah. either of these other segments. So I think we're going to be turning this into right. four segments, which is, is cool. So thank, well, you, thank you so much. And You will um, be surprised at all of the ways I can say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what we're seeing so far is something I've suspected for, for yeah. some time. And um, you know, when I was in graduate school, it seemed like there was this just cut and dry way. Uh, there was this neat process in the in developing or the formation of the canon. And I've just come to realize more and more that um, it was kind of a fuzzy process. Um, yeah. It is not as cut and dry as I originally suspected. And so looking, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the New Testament. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. 